I've been looking forward to this conversation for a very long time, for more than a year, you know. And I, I couldn't do it until I actually bought Sheldon Solomon's and Tom Pizinski and Jack Greenberg uh, book, The Warm at the Core. I've read, uh, I've read in his Becker's book, The Denial of Death, but I couldn't actually invite him on until I actually read his work and, 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 and his body's work. Uh, they discovered a uh, terror management theory and it has been fun honestly honestly to actually understand what is going on in nigeria i think one can actually do that without understanding the foundation of uh, the human behavior what makes us stick and uh, it helps me in prescribing a good solution for the problem nigeria is facing so uh his name is sheldon solomon and he, his champions is i've seen him more debates and more more interviews and more press conference than uh, uh, pre- uh than uh, others and i invited him on the show he basically to go with uh evolution by natural selection uh essential philosophy and anthropology even social- sociology so uh, i'll be uh uh you uh, talked about great things honestly you talked about great things it was so good we scheduled they knew it so here's the thing there are spaces among the uh, around the charts uh, around this chart you know things are actually filled up uh, uh the network issues and i i'm trying my best to actually fix that it and it requires me to actually buy a new 5g that 5g mtn 5g uh, router so so that's the only way i can actually have this conversation this conversation was so good and it could have been better honestly without any kind of interruption it could have been better it could have gone on for for longer you know and because that was what I actually planned for until we actually had to schedule any day. Wow, wow, we can't actually postpone this. We schedule any day. We've been talking since then on my email guns. We've been exchanging emails since then, exchanging ideas. So uh, I, I, I hope you support this uh, talk. Honestly, honestly, once you actually see this, once you actually see, once you actually listen to this very well, you will actually see why I am saying that commerce won't actually help this Nigeria unite. Honestly. That Nigeria is not united at the at, at the very moment, and uh, and uh, the only way to actually do that is to actually manage the ter- our terror of death. You know uh, what exactly religion and uh, tribalism are no, and and uh, and all of these things, and actually understanding that, and actually prescribing the solution to that. So thank you guys, uh, enjoy this uh, chat, support the show, and uh, thank you. I've been looking forward to this for a very long time, you know. Well, me too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, how are you doing now? I, the, uh, the first time I saw your I, I saw your interview was on Lex, you know, Lex Human Show. Uh, and I, and uh, your work actually further confirms a lot of things that, that I've been thinking, you know, that I've been working on for a while. So, uh, I, I can't, can't hear my accent. I have an accent, right? Pardon me? I, I lost you for a second. I, I have an accent, right? Can you hear me like, you know? Oh, fine. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. All right. All right. I will, I will actually just jump right into it. Uh, the questions that, that I actually have with me. I am actually trying to write something like, like create this sort of philosophy around, uh, around some things, yeah? Some things I've, I've discovered with your work and, and what I've taught in the past, yeah? Uh, this is your book. Uh, it, it isn't available in Nigeria. It isn't, it isn't available for sale in Nigeria. I had to buy it on Amazon. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, uh, the introduction will come later. You know, uh, from first, what was it you set out to write uh, in your book? You know, what was it you set out to write with your book with Sheridan, uh, Jeff Greenberg and Tom Pizinski? That's right. So those are my two buddies from graduate school. Yeah. And uh, we have been um, interested in these ideas and the research that uh, we've done together uh, for going on uh, more than 40 years. Mm. Uh, okay, okay. So uh, how much of uh, uh, how much of uh, how much of our life, how much of our actions is, is predicated on the on the fear of death? Ah, so great question. So um, basically, according to Ernest Becker, a, a cultural anthropologist uh, who um, in 1973 won a Pulitzer Prize for a book called The Denial of Death. And our work is based on 
um, his ideas. And, and what Becker said um, is that what makes the years of evolutionary history to survive at all costs. But uh, what we have going for us as humans um, you know, it's a big brain and that allows us to do a lot of things. And that's awesome and exciting. And, and it makes us realize that we exist, which is also awesome and exciting. But at the same time, it could be dreadful and terrible because according to Ernest Becker, if you're smart enough to know that you're here, you're also smart enough to know that like all living things, your life is of finite duration. And that means that you too uh, will someday die. And, and moreover, we're smart enough to know that we can die at any time for reasons that we could never anticipate or control. And, and so what Becker argued is that if that's all we thought about, uh, I'm going to die someday, or I could walk outside and get killed by a virus uh, or a meteor, that we, we wouldn't even be able to stand up in the morning. We would just be overwhelmed with exist existential anxiety. And, and his, his argument is that the way that we manage existential terror, and that's why we call our work terror management theory, is by embracing culture that we share with other people in our culture uh, that helps reduce death anxiety by giving us each a sense that we're valuable people in a meaningful universe. And, and according to Becker, whether we're aware of it or not, that's what we spend most of our lives doing. We're incredibly motivated to maintain confidence as faith that we're worthy individuals. And that's what we call self-esteem, the belief that you're a person of value in a world of meaning. And so basically the argument is that all of our lives are spent trying to feel good about ourselves and to bolster confidence in our beliefs. But the reason why we're doing that is to minimize death anxiety. Uh, and one last thing, is not that that's true, uh, whenever our beliefs are challenged or whenever our self-esteem is threatened, we will automatically engage in defensive reactions in, in order to reduce our anxieties. Uh, what do you think differentiates those with a genetic propensity towards exploration and uh, and the yearning for greatness and uh, the conventional person? You know, someone who doesn't actually want anything, anything uh, much about from life. You know, what do you do? there are those that are, that are driven towards poetry, that are driven towards love and wine, and are driven towards uh, arts and and what about those that, that actually have do not want anything to do with that? There, there, there are those that just want meaning. Meaning, serious meaning in everything, like you said, meaning in everything they do. Like, oh, wow. Yeah. The, the, actually, that's a, a very fine point. One point that I, I was making a, a few moments ago, mm -hmm. and, and that's just the, what our research suggests is that um, when death is on our minds, it just magnifies our pre existing tendencies. So, for example, people uh, who describe themselves in terms of politics as liberal they become more liberal. And people who describe themselves as conservative, they become more conservative when death is on their minds. But you actually ask a, a very fine question, if I, if I got it right, and that is the, why uh, do some people seem to just mindlessly conform uh, to the demands of their cultural surroundings? Uh, as opposed to other people who seem to be more uh, just individually uh, oriented towards forging their own meaning. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's um, really, for some, that's kind of the whole basis uh, of Ernest Becker, uh, Martin Heidegger. Uh, talked about that uh, uh, based on the work of the philosopher Kierkegaard. Uh, and what, what they said is, look, uh, that every one of us is prone to death anxiety, 
above in the same way. And so Heidegger had this, uh, he called it people, and maybe all of us from time to time are so overwhelmed with death anxiety that, that we just literally become mindless, culturally constructed meat puppets. Kierkegaard had a phrase, he said uh, that we often tranquilize ourselves Absolutely. with the True. trivial. Yeah. And, I, and when I heard that, I was like, wow, uh, unfortunately, that's most of the people uh, in America right now, because they're either sitting at home, uh, just drowning themselves in pills or alcohol, or they're out running around on the streets, just screaming angrily, but they're certainly not doing anything constructive or decent. And they're certainly not expressing themselves as unique individuals yearning for meaning the way that you describe it. Yeah. Uh, for the Heideggers of the world, that, that requires are, are able to accept the reality of the human condition. We, we can uh, accept that we're here for a short amount of time and, and that there may not be anything thereafter. But rather uh, than that hurling us into the psychological abyss, you know, that flight from death, uh, what these folks proclaim is that that could ultimately be completely liberating and uplifting. The, and I, I like the language that Martin Heidegger uh, uses when he says, look, if you have truly come to terms with your own finitude, uh, then uh, it, the world may not look that much different and neither will you, but your entire attitude towards life has changed. And he points out, he says that basically he uses the term anticipatory resoluteness. He says, oh, you're looking forward to living and that you're living with great purpose. And that in Heidegger's words, you have solicitous regard for everyone and everything around you, that you care about people. that if you get that far, that, that life feels like this just ongoing adventure that's completely filled with unshakable joy. Oh. And, and like, that sounds great. It kind of sounds like a fairy tale, but these guys are not naive. They're, they're not saying that that gets rid of suffering and they're not saying that that gets rid of anxiety. Rather, what they're saying is that we can come to terms with our death in a way that ultimately enriches our lives. And, and that if we do that, not only will we be better off, uh, but so will the rest of the world. Because uh, according to Becker, uh, almost all of the terrible things that we do to each other as human beings malignant manifestations of death anxiety hmm. wow that's great now thanks <laughs> thanks for that all right do you uh, do you see uh, uh a difference like have you connected the difference between uh self-esteem and and group esteem and uh xenophobia and racism and uh and uh, because i think groups with uh high self-esteem you know like groups with high self-esteem Often think of uh, outsiders uh, as uh, as uh, uh, they are often discriminatory to outsiders and uh, are often ethnic, ethnic, ethnically homogeneous societies. Uh, and uh, I've observed this in several societies, and I think uh, have you have you seen the connection? Yes, that's a, again that's a, a fantastic point. And uh, what makes self-esteem a, a complicated construct? Because uh, on the one hand. Um, obviously, all of us would like to feel good about ourselves. Uh, uh, Virginia Woolf, a dead uh, British writer, she said, without self-confidence, we are like babes in the cradle. And, and that's right. But then what Virginia Woolf goes on to point out is just what you said, which is that there's two ways to feel good about yourself. 
One is to be genuinely proud based on your actual achievements, be it you or your group. Another is to put it is a lot of times we use other people, we have to belittle them, we have to make them look small in our eyes in order to make ourselves look big. And, and that's when self-esteem becomes uh, highly problematic. It's also when it becomes unfortunately uh, confused and conflated uh, with narcissism. Yeah. Because it's, you feel good about yourself without having to assume that you're better than anybody else. Uh, on the other hand, narcissistic individuals, that is the basis yeah. uh, of their self-esteem. And so I think the trick here, uh, and it's it's a tough one, uh, is and maintain a sense of self-worth without having to do it at the expense of, of other people. Scientists uh, over here, that's their distinction between patriotism. You can be a patriot and be proud of your group without insisting that you're God's chosen people and that you're better than anybody else and anybody who doesn't share your views, we have to exterminate. Hmm. Uh, uh, that's, that's, I think that actually requires a sense of, a sense of kinship with everyone else, you know, and can we get there? Yes. So uh, again, these are brilliant points. These are great questions that I think you're quite right to be able to get there. Uh, we have to do a better job at acknowledging our connection to our fellow human beings. Uh, and so one of the things, you know, so one of the things that we find in our research, Daniel, is that uh, when we remind people that they're going to die, they hate and they hurt other people who look different or don't share their beliefs. So for example, when German people are reminded that they're going to die, they sit closer to people who look German and they sit further away from people who look Turkish. Uh, and we've shown in other studies when you're reminded that you're going to die and somebody doesn't have this opportunity to actually hurt them, they are more hurtful and aggressive. On the other hand, if we tell people, uh, if we say, we call it a common humanity prime, if we say to people, look, uh, you know what? Everybody on earth, we are much more, everybody on earth is descended from a single group from Africa, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. and. We are all closely related, no matter where we are and what we look like. And anyway, when we tell people that, which has the benefit of being true, and then we remind them that they're going to die, they don't hate somebody or hurt them because they're different. And so, yes, I think we can go a long way if we can ever hit that sweet spot yeah. where we can be proud of ourselves and proud of our group without having to disparage somebody else in the process. And in fact, the Ernest Becker dude in his book, Escape from Evil, uh, at the, this was after he died because he said, I don't even know if humans are a viable form of life. We seem to be unable to tolerate other people who don't share our beliefs to the point uh, where we're happily willing to exterminate them in genocidal atrocities. And, and it may be uh, that humans, we're just going to destroy ourselves unless we can come up with a belief system that's strong enough to stand on its own merits without having to say, uh, these are our arch enemies, the scapegoats that we need to kill in order for us to be fine on earth. Yeah. Uh, something that really stood out to me uh, in your book was, uh, yeah, like, uh, yeah, like the violence that other groups actually experience, uh, and uh, how they lose uh, their confidence on uh, of of their of their of the stories they 
they they live by and then uh and uh and i think much of i think a little i've observed in africa my people a little bit of us i think to some extent we are we have a self a sort of uh, inferiority complex you know a little bit of inferiority to other groups you know like and i've observed this among us like we have low self esteem compared to other groups when i think about it and uh, and i have uh, been wondering how much of uh, how much of the violence that I, I'm not woke, I'm not the kind of person that thinks slavery is something uniquely to unique to or uh, just just the West. But I've been wondering how much of uh, the colonization and the sucking of Benin, you know, the sucking of Benin uh, and the violence that actually erupted while in Africa and other African countries were colonized actually is a consequence of of. Uh, uh, well, I, I self-esteem is a consequence of that, you know. I, I do not know, you know. I, I have been wondering about. To what extent is that, you know? Well, I think uh, I'm with uh, W.E.B. Du Bois on this one, uh, the African-American scholar who was the first uh, PhD from Harvard, yeah. uh, who, uh, uh, you know, well over a, a hundred years ago pointed out, he called it double consciousness. He just said that, referring to the United States, but I think this is true uh, everywhere in the world that put it, it you, you don't have to demonize the West or uh, white Europeans uh, as uh, uniquely diabolical. Um, but in fairness, historically, uh, they're responsible for a catastrophic set of arrangements, both environmental and economic and political and psychological, that have had devastatingly traumatic effects on uh, people all over the world, but particularly uh, in Africa. You know, it's, it's not only it is the cradle this art science uh music uh, mm. is indigenous to africa uh, and yet what we have done um is to construct uh, i think a, a a shocking and appalling caste system in order to justify just so that their heads don't explode from the cognitive dissonance of on the one hand, uh, wanting to think of ourselves uh, as fair and equitable and coming from countries where we say that all people are created equal. Well, in order to reconcile that with the last four or 500 years of atrocities, uh, what we've said is, well, okay, that must mean that the people of color that were enslaved are not quite human. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and it's, I think from that, that the residual um, uh, perce negative perceptions uh, from people of color in general, yeah, I think those still prevail in that they have devastating effects on other individuals and other cultures. And the sooner we rectify that, the better off we'll all be. Not only that, but we need everybody. You know, the yeah. world right now is in the kind of condition that it would be foolish to rely uh, on the way of life that uh, we now have that has brought us to the point where the earth is no longer fit for human habitation. Uh, how about some time for humility? And uh, to step back and let all folks from all cultures uh, give us a sense uh, of their own local knowledge and wisdom. It would be a fine moment for that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, what about uh, materialism and, and self-esteem, you know? I think uh, the world got increasingly, increasingly peaceful. I think the world got increasingly peaceful with the more things that we can acquire, the more things, the more stuff we can acquire. You know, and and uh, 
and I can see the world is getting a, a little bit right, right wing right now. Like the like Europe is becoming a, a little bit more right wing with the economic distress they are facing, you know. And I think once the groups of people feel a little bit of economic distress, they become increasingly increasingly right wing or increasingly fundamental. And uh, and uh, what about the connection between materialism and self esteem? Well, in um, yes, in a material world, uh, we measure rather than by what they do, and what some uh, what some psychologically or that's good for generating business, or uh, you know, in that you know, capital-based economies will fall yeah. continuous growth. Yeah. Uh, and so therefore, for there, there's nothing better than a world in which people measure themselves by what they have because enough is never enough. Mm. Uh, but uh, while that keeps markets thriving, it really doesn't keep people satisfied. Uh, because, uh, you know, to be silly, but not, uh, you know, when most animals have enough to eat, they take a nap and it's when they need something else that yeah. they'll go and procure it. Now, having said that, it's great that as human beings, we have come up with the technological capacity to generate a surplus so that uh, we can be comfortable uh, in times, but uh, in a completely material culture uh, where our only beliefs are how much, uh, well, now we've gotten into a position uh, where, uh, according to Max Weber, for example, the German sociologist, he says that we've actually become a kind of puppets that are, are now subservient to Sorry, I lost you. I, lo I lost you again. You know that's okay. It happens all the time. Yeah. You know, so we we're okay. We we're talking about materialism. Yeah. And I was, you know, what I was saying is that what a lot of folks argue, and this is not to suggest that uh, we go back and and to uh, you know nomadic hunter and gatherers. Uh, so much as material goods uh, with other meaning making aspirations uh okay uh, uh uh what about love you know uh and let me say something and let me say something that making love to a great woman that uh, woman of us won a temporary respite from death you know so and i've discovered something about about humans i think like when people lose uh uh, uh, a woman they love when guys lo lose the, the a woman they love they are often driven towards uh material material acquisition you know and once they have uh, someone uh, they are in love with you know they are often satisfied you know yes so again brilliant point uh you know love does conquer death <laughs> these do and so if we're in a relationship uh with a woman and everything's going great uh, that's one of the best ways to manage death anxiety uh, constructively because it's in the context of a loving relationship but when I, I like your point that when um uh, yeah when, when relationships are suddenly dissolved that brings death anxiety to the to the forefront uh, of of, of One way to respond is is with tremendous material yearnings. Some people, if they're in the army, they're like, "Oh, I got to go out and kill somebody." But yes, <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> How does one come to terms with this? Oh, okay. That to be silly, I I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, that I I. I I, one of the reasons I got involved with this work is that I realized when, since I was eight, mother died when I realized that I would die someday. Uh, I've not been, um, I've not been happy about that fact. And so 
a lot of my work is has a very personal basis and that's for me to uh, come to terms with the fact that I won't be here forever. What, what we do know is that, you know, as far as we can tell, people have been concerned about that since minute one, uh, all of the world's great religions and every philosophy in the world. Uh, uh, coming to terms with the fact that we'll not be here forever. Uh, and the and to argue that humbly recognize that fact, but when you ask how to do that, yeah, I'm not quite sure. So, in, in other words, for some people in some cultures, this is purely a religious pursuit. For other people, that's what happens in the context of therapy for other people it is something that happens quite unconsciously and subtly over time as we just to um, engage in the process of living and i know that that sounds kind of ambiguous because it is i don't think there's a pill or, or a recipe or a particular program. Um, but what we do know uh, is that um, things that appear to be related to coming to terms uh, with death, uh, in positive psychology these days, they talk about awe and humility and gratitude as like the three pillars of psychological well-being. They're like, wow, you know, sometimes maybe we should just instead of being so busy that we're, we, we don't have any time to step back and appreciate that we're alive. Maybe just look around and be like, wow, life is awesome. And, and all of us have had those feelings. And, and what the psychologists tell us is when we realize how awesome it is to be alive, that that makes us humble we don't need to be better than everybody else. We're happy just that we get to be part of it. And, and, and when we're humble, that makes us grateful because any of us that slept in a bed last night or had something to eat, eat today, uh, we should be really grateful. As my father used to say, the, the world doesn't owe you a living. And, and uh, we should every day uh, be poignantly and profoundly aware uh, of should be and how grateful uh, we ought be for the gifts that life has given us. And I think those would be good ways to start, e even though I believe that there's a lot more that we might be doing. But as a general response, I think that's uh, good enough. All right, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on my show. I th I have I have some ideas I would like to share with you. I think we would actually uh, uh I think I would actually share you a different time, like a second part to our conversation. Then I, I I'll get the new router. Let's do it. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Good to sir. see you. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day, sir. For you too. Yes, sir.